Hey, thank you for tuning in to watch this message. We believe that the Word of God is alive and active. The Bible says, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like a lamp to our feet and a light onto our path. We hope that this message blesses you today. Man, worship was so good. Oh, yeah. I was back in the back. Uh, it, was, it was neat because I always spend time with the Lord. Like every second is available to Him. So it's not like, I mean, sometimes we get to pull away and have that quiet time. But you should always have your life open for Him. You should never like, just, just be careful not to so get your schedule so exact that you, He can't come unless you have time for Him. <laughs> It's so weird. We so separate the sacred from the secular and we've really jacked stuff up in there. You know, we separate the sacred from the secular, meaning we're going on Wednesday night, we're gonna have service, you know, once a Wednesday, once a month. This is that Wednesday, correct? Where we all get together and it's like, wow, so good. And then Sunday, yeah. And then maybe your college night, yeah. And then, but what about like when you wake up, yeah so serious like you know you got your job and you're working but my bible says that whatever i do in word or deed i'm gonna do it unto the lord that means he wants to be at my workplace with me he's excited to hang out he doesn't want me to leave him at home when i go to work because i'm working a secular job so he doesn't want to be there <laughs> is that weird that's weird to me because like he wants to be at your secular job so that he can make it sacred. He really likes to leaven everything. He loves that. He was, he's just wishing and wanting us to believe the word. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> People are like Todd White, street evangelist. I'm like, Todd White, full-time Christian. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. I was talking to Josiah today just about the word street, just the perception of people when you bring the word street in. When I say street, immediately people go, ah, that's not me. <laughs> Why? Because you've separated. You can say what you want and think what you want, but I promise this. The second that you got born again, the day that you said yes to Jesus, you were really excited about it. And what's different today than was that day? You, not him. You shouldn't have sang that last song, because it's on. Oh, I'm not kidding. Like you said, replace the lamp of my first love that burned with what? Go with me to Isaiah 11.2. This is going to be exciting tonight. People are going to be absolutely wrecked with the gospel. The truth of the fire of the Holy Spirit is going to be recognized by people that have left trash on their fire. What we need is burning one. I, I looked at that guy's shirt and it said, revival's not coming. And I'm like, oh, it's gotta have a good front. Tell me it's got a good front, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going up there to talk about a shirt if it's not having a good front on this shirt. Because revival is here and, and I'm, I'm all about that. Because when I got saved, I became that. Like, I wasn't that. I was dead. And then something happened to make me come alive. But what made me come alive wasn't supposed to get old. I'm not supposed to just feel him when I come to church. I'm not supposed to just, oh my gosh, that worship was amazing, get goosebumps and then live like hell the rest of the week. <laughs> you guys, this is gonna be very agitating, but very uplifting. Honestly, because God will offend your mind to reveal your heart. We have placed things in here that don't belong. And it is prohibiting your flame from burning correctly. We have let the, we have, we have fed on the world and taste tested Jesus. This isn't about just doing a devotion, guys. Devotion's not going to cut it. Just getting up, taking a few scriptures, reading them and thinking that's enough is not going to cut it. It says to take his word and put it before you, his law. 
and put his law. David rejoiced. Like, you look at Psalm 119, that's absolutely nuts. Like, David said, oh, I love your law. Like, I'm not talking about the New Testament. I'm not talking about the New Covenant. I'm talking David was like, oh, I love your law. Oh, I love Leviticus. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I burn for your law. It's crazy, right? We look at the law, we're like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I do not love legalism. Do you know the law wasn't legalism? God didn't write legalism. Do you know, God's not the author and finisher of legalism. Are you with me? Like, God didn't write the law because he was a legalist. God wrote the law so that we'd fully be dependent upon him and realize we've all fallen short and can't do it on our own. Like, guys, like, God's not a legalist. Sometimes we look at, we look at commandments and we're like, we, know, we don't have to do those because we're not under law, we're under grace. And all of a sudden, we get so sloppy. And we're like so adamant about, oh, I'm not in legalism. You can't make me legal. It's not about legal. It's about love. Like if I fall in love with Jesus, I don't want to do the things that violate his heart. Like I'm, I've, if I'm doing those things that violate his heart, I don't love him. This is so weird. Like it's the weird thing. I travel the world and I preach the gospel and I talk to people all the time. And I get in conversations with pastors and leaders. And it's not like they love sin. It's not about that. It's God's holy. Like, he gave us Holy Spirit. <laughs> do you know that Peter, do you know how many people say they can relate to Peter? Like, which one? <laughs> the one before he got born again or after he got born again? Come on, some people, oh, yeah, I can relate to Peter, buddy. I mean, not all the people, I can relate to him. Well, you need saved. <laughs> yes. Holiness is becoming uncool because culture is sweeping and has come into the church and invaded the church. And we've allowed culture to come in and we don't want to be like, we don't want to offend people. We want to be culturally relevant. Why would we sacrifice truth on an altar of cultural relevance? Cultural, why would I sacrifice truth on an altar of being culturally relevant? Like, Jesus is amazing. You know what he says? I had a, I had a, a relative. You guys okay? We're going there tonight. It's going to be good. It really is. But do you guys, how many of you would like to be like Jesus? Look, only, only a quarter of you raised your hand. You think that's a setup, right? Do you know the Bible tells you your mission in life is to be like Jesus? You're here to be Christ-like. You're here to shine. You're here to blaze. You're here to shine. You're here to burn. You're not here to serve this world. You're here to serve the world, Jesus. You're here to give the world the gospel. You're here to give the gospel to everyone that you say you love. You're here to give the gospel to everyone, and if you don't love them, then we're violating the law. I don't, all I have is the pastor raising his hand, and so I'm excited. I am, because I'll be happy for all of you. Because my joy doesn't come from your thankfulness to me. My joy comes from my salvation. My joy comes from my prayers being answered. In this, your joy will be fulfilled. Whatever you ask in my name. Jesus said, whatever. So, so many times we pray and we don't have it. Why? Why? Could it be we got some junk in there that needs to get out? Could it be that we're wanting God to do stuff for us and we really don't know him? Could it be that God really wants us to know him? What would it be like for you to pray for the sick and see lots of miracles and see the dead raised, the blind here, the, the blind see, the deaf here? Like, would that be amazing? What would it be like to live your whole life and see the most tremendous miracles and stand before God and him say, away from me, I never knew you? We don't, you know. We say, well, it's not possible because we did the miracles. Oh, it's possible. I know a lot of people that operate in gifting, but they don't operate in love. I know a lot of people that can see the most tremendous miracles, but they have no intimacy with the Father. And God didn't say, away from me, you didn't say you knew me. Or away from me, you said you knew me. He said, away from me, I never knew you. There's a difference between you saying that you know God and you knowing that he knows you. 
Jesus was known by the Father. Do you know his life was like absolutely ridiculous? You know when he was healing and doing everything that he was doing, like when it was time for everybody to crash out, what did Jesus do? <laughs> I gotta go. And then he's coming back before everybody wakes up. Oh my gosh, I need my sleep. You know what Jesus said? Be careful. He said, be careful. He said, pray, watch and pray. To the disciples. These disciples were told by Jesus, watch and pray in the garden. Do you remember Garden of Gethsemane? Why did he say watch and pray? So that you do not enter into temptation. I, I'm gonna come down there, I think, to run around a little. Am I allowed to? We good? Woo! Okay. He said, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. How many times have we been living our Christian life and all these things keep biding for our affection? How many times have we been, look, I've talked to people, I talk to people all the time, like, man, this, yeah, this thing, I just got this thing, this, this thing. God doesn't want you to have that thing. What it's doing is it's muddying your flame. It's dirtying your intimacy. It's trashing you inside. We call it normal, because it's the way that seems right to a man. We've incorporated Jesus in for what we can get from him, but we haven't surrendered who we are completely and entirely. It's not just a one-time surrender. It's not an altar call where you say, you know what, Jesus, I, I give you my life. Right, right. Because we give him our life. You know what happens there? It says it in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. Jesus says this. He's, ooh, there's light. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm like ADD in the spirit. Just, we're good. Yeah, all right. Jesus says, come to me. All of, how many of you remember when you came to him? How many of you remember the, when you said yes to Jesus? Come on, I don't care who you are. You remember when that happened, right? If you didn't, you need to have a time right now that you remember. Like, tonight could be your remember. Like, we get, we're going to have a come to Jesus moment tonight. Why? Because we need a fresh, burning flame. I'll go back to Isaiah, but I want to I share Matthew, because we, we've all done this. If you're a Christian, you've done this. If you're not, you'll want to. It says, all of you who are weary and burdened down by life, come to me. You are weighed down. You who are a burden, you who are, there's a load on you that doesn't belong on you. Come to me, and I will give you rest. So the second that we say yes to Jesus, there's this, no more shackles, no more chains. And it's like, oh, I am free to run. Right? I think I was on key. Was I close? All right, thanks, baby. Ooh. I am free. I'm trying. But the thing is, is that's exciting. Like, it's true excitement. You know that you know that you know that you know that thing was broken. It happened today at the place we were at where a girl was just under bondage. She's hurting. She's being crushed by life. And she, when we talked to her about Jesus, she didn't want to hear nothing. She didn't. And then I shared my testimony and she was like, why do you share your testimony? Because it's real. It's real. People are like, well, I don't like sharing it because it's embarrassing. That's because you're not free. The reason why you won't share your testimony is because you're still doing it. You're still living it and you're not free. It wouldn't be embarrassing if it wasn't the person you are anymore. That one hurts. But you can be free. You don't have to live there. Look, you share your testimony because it's what God did. He did it. He did it. And there's no, listen, your life needs to be 100% different from the testimony that you share about who you used to be. I'm not kidding. Like those things are supposed to be broken and gone and crushed and annihilated. And old things have become new. All things. All things became new. Old things have passed away. All those things that used to grip you are no longer gripping because God has gripped you and they can't. So when you share your testimony, the anointing is there because it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It is the anointing that breaks it. Isaiah 10, 27. And that day I will break the yoke off you because it is the anointing oil or the anointing that breaks that thing. 
That's what we need. You need to have the anointing increased upon your life. The reality of what you came out of and what you're in needs to be so drastically different that there's nothing that looks like anything that you were that it's so foreign to a person you're sharing because Jesus literally did it. He did it. Like it never gets old. I share my testimony like probably 10, 15 times a day, sometimes 20 times a day. I still do. It's been 19 years. Why do you do that? Because it's the anointing that broke the yoke off of me. It's the anointing that keeps me burning and from ever going back there again. And I've actually stepped into the place of not just coming to him so he could give me rest. I'm actually learning from him so I can maintain it. Jesus says, come to me in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. All of you who are weary and burdened down by life, come to me and I will give you rest. So we come to him. That's the day we get born again. That's, woohoo, we're saved. Like, you know that something has happened. The grass is greener. The sky is bluer. You hear the birds. You see the sunrise. It's absolutely nuts. Depending on how dark and how, how wrapped up you were in darkness, the brighter it is. Are you with me? See, testimony means do it again, God. Testimony means, God, if you did it in me, you'll do it in them because you're no respecter of persons. So when you're sharing that, that same thing is available. Right now, God is that thing. That same God that set you free will set them free. But if you're not free, you can't share your testimony. Guys, sometimes we think we'll never be free until, you know, we get to heaven. And if that's true, Jesus is not your savior, death is. Death is not my savior, Jesus is. But when he saves me, when I get rescued, I mean, what does it mean to be saved? You are taken from darkness to light. You are taken from lost to found. You are taken from blind to see. You're taken from death to life. Jesus didn't pay a price to make bad men good. He paid a price to make dead men live. You were dead in your sin. You were dead in your trespasses. You were dead. Life was not life. It wasn't abundant life. It was death, loss, and destruction at every turn. No matter where you went, it didn't work well because you are God's creation. And so nothing worked well before Christ came. Then all of a sudden he came. But here's what the majority of the church does. We get born again, that's essential, but it's to unlock your potential. Born again is essential, but it is to unlock your potential. Everything, when you get saved, has been given to you according to life and godliness. Everything. Jesus says, all that the Father has is mine, and all that I mine, all that, all that I have is yours. So everything according to life and godliness has been given to us. We have absolute access to everything. But because we do not tend our soul, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, ah, oh, take my yoke upon you. My yoke. Well, the yoke of Jesus destroys the yoke of bondage. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Jesus, look, Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. So that anointing, Jesus is anointing, the anointing of Jesus came upon you when you said yes to God. Woo, yay, it's a whole new world. Totally exciting, totally amazing. It's all internal. It's not something out here, it's in here. Come on, God wants to give you more than you can ask or think according to the power that is within you. So the same Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 11, that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he wants to quicken your mortal body. I don't know about you, but I, I need quickening now. I don't need quickening just then. I need it now. Not just for resurrection. Look, when you, when you give your life to Christ and you get baptized in the trough, when you go down in there, 
you are being, it's like you're being buried with Jesus in baptism. You're being buried with him in that baptism, buried with him. And when you come up out of that water, if they do it right and hold you down long enough, <laughs> you gotta wait till the bubbles stop and the feet stop moving. <laughs> Don't do that. You come up in the likeness, in the likeness of his resurrection. You come up and you walk in newness of life. What is newness of life? That means that the life that you come up in and you're living is absolutely completely contrary to the life that you had before you went in there. It's the same for everybody. Like the gospel doesn't change for Todd. The gospel didn't change for Pastor Mike. He didn't, didn't change for that. It didn't change for Josiah. It didn't, didn't change for anybody. It's the same. You know, Jesus told the disciples, he says, don't go until he comes. Are you with me? Yet Jesus breathed on them, and John 20 breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Did they receive or did they not? They received the Holy Spirit when Jesus breathed on them. They're in the, they're in the room. They're, they're totally freaked out. They're totally scared. Jesus comes in, walks through a wall, walks through a door. Either way, he's inside, and the door's still locked. That is freaky. He says, peace. They need peace. They saw him on that cross. Like, they need peace. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they received the Holy Spirit. They did. And so many of the church think that that's the time when you go. Because he says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So they think that that's where we get sent. We just get sent. But that's not it. Jesus told him in Acts 1, don't go. Don't go until you're endued with tongues? No, he didn't say that. He didn't say don't go until you're endued with tongues. Is our tongues important? Absolutely. Edifies your spirit, man. Your spirit, man, grows every time you pray in the spirit. So your spirit, man, like Smith Wigglesworth said, my, even though I'm a small man in stature, my spirit, man, is a giant. Because your spirit, man, can grow, 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 grow. And hopefully this body doesn't grow the same as your spirit, man, does. And hopefully your head doesn't grow. Because I know a lot of that. I've seen a lot of that. Where this is so big. Because gifts. People start walking in healing. They think that they're something else. You couldn't do any of that unless God was doing it. Let's not lose focus here and lose priority. No, no, no. He's the Father. He's amazing. You have to steward your own heart. You have to weed your own garden. You constantly have to pull weeds, and the truth is the weed puller. Have relationship with Holy Spirit. He'll tell you when something's wrong. You know it, actually, when you do it. Oh, my gosh. When someone's saved and they do something wrong, oh, my gosh. Your conscience has become sensitized. Because when you get born again, the blood of Jesus doesn't, like animals, cover over top of you. The blood of Jesus comes internally and cleanses you from inside. And you know right away... Whoa. Like you remember when you first got saved and threw a trash thing and it missed the trash can? You're like, oh. And no one's watching you, but you picked it up. Does anybody remember that? Did that ever happen to anybody else? It still happens to me 19 years later. I don't think that my life is just some special example. I believe that it's normal. I believe that living unholy and lackadaisical, calling it grace, is actually twisted and demonic strategy set up to get you to go to hell. People are like, well, I don't, you don't talk like that. Well, do you not think you're going to be judged? Oh, oh my. There's so many Christians, well, I passed judgment, brother. Oh, no. You need to get this, like, really deep in your spirit. It's not about fearing judgment. It's about a hopeful expectation that when you face him, he's going to say, well done. Yes. The only reason you would fear judgment is because you've got trash in your life and you've got stuff that you've allowed to come back in again. So now, instead of living clean, and staying completely crisp and clear and clean and pursuing truth, you've allowed different things to come in and you've compromised and you've let that compromise completely take your faith and dwindle it down to where you can't even share it 
because it's no longer good news to you. I'll keep smiling because I love Jesus with all my heart. Every one of you know what I'm saying is true. There's nothing in what I'm saying that is condemnation at all. Condemnation is from hell. No, it's just the clear, crisp truth. The clear, crisp truth that saved you. When you got born again, you knew it. You knew that this was holy. You knew that this was beautiful. And we allow life to speak louder than love. We've got all these different things that we need to get likes. We've got Facebook, you've got Instagram, you've got all these different things. And if you get enough likes, you feel like you made it. Gosh, the only reason we need likes is because we don't have love. Because we love the praise of people way more than honoring God and receiving honor from God. We love the stroking and petting of people. Man, if I loved that, I'd never be able to preach what I preach. Oh my gosh, I'd never be invited anywhere. Be like, come on, we got a huge 40,000 member church. Come and preach. Who I, I dare you to let me preach. Because I won't make anybody feel comfortable. The reason why it's so big is because people are comfortable. How you like me now? How you like them? Now? I'm all right. Because the likes and the claps and the thank yous and the oh my gosh, you're amazing doesn't touch me. Why? Because then I'm not going to preach what Jesus told the disciples to preach. You know what he told them to preach? Go preach repentance. Go preach repentance. We're like, well, I don't really, you know, that repentance thing, it makes me feel bad. That's because you got sin in your life. The only reason you feel bad when someone preaches repentance is because you need things to, to get free from. Peop and people... Never mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's good to me, man. I, I, I love you, but because I love you, I'll speak the truth to you. This is like, this is like, for me, this is like a family house for me. This isn't a normal place. I preach a lot of different places. Like, Pastor Mike, you guys are like family, and I, I know you know it, but I'm saying it's more to me. This is more to me than just a normal gathering. You have something very, very amazing going on. But if you don't steward this with holiness, it will be just another thing that people come and it's just a flash in the pan and it'll be gone. I don't know if you know, but every revival that's ever hit the church has started and finished in repentance. And when repentance got lightened up, the revival ended. God's really into repentance. He loves it. People are like, well, I already, I already repented when I got born again. I don't need to anymore. Oh, you are so deceived. Oh, buddy. Let me ask you a question. Can you still hear his whisper? Can you still hear God? Oh, can you still hear his still small voice? Can you still hear his whisper? Is his love still searing and burning inside of your heart? Or is it kind of faded away and you need a worship song to get there? <laughs> Do you need somebody to stir you up so that you can actually like sense him? Do you wake up in the morning? Is, is your first response, oh no, another day? Or is it, Holy Spirit, I am so glad I get to meet you again this morning. Thank you for being here with me. Do you need TV to fill in the gap so that you can watch your favorite show because it's what you do? Or when the Holy Spirit, if he would whisper to you in fourth, fourth quarter and your team's about to score, if he whispered to you, would you pull away or watch the game and make him wait? Where are you? in your faith have you allowed life to speak louder does CNN intrigue you is it good to watch the news and see everything that's going wrong did you lose your love for God when the political arena didn't happen what you said it was did you did you get so angry when it didn't happen and think that everything's lost or is Jesus where your hope is found 
when a kid goes astray and all of a sudden they're going bonkers, you get upset at God because he didn't hear your prayer? Do you have offense towards more than anybody? Have you let somebody else hurt you and cause you to stop loving God the way that you should? Have you allowed people to hurt you and offend you? And do you have problems with people even in your church that you talk to people about them behind their back, give them the wrong lens to see them through? Do you call it normal? Is that okay? Do you call people and gossip and call it prayer? That's heart check stuff. I don't want any of that junk in my life. You know what I do when I take communion? I lift up the bread and I thank God for every person that hates me. I do. I'm not kidding. I do it. I pray for them. I say, thank you, Father. It says, do not. You know that communion is the only meal that'll kill you if you do it wrong? Paul says, many of you are dead and sick. Many of you have fallen asleep and are sick because you haven't discerned the Lord's body. What do you think that means? It says, when you come to the table, when you come and partake of the bread and partake of the blood it's not just just remembering what Jesus did it's remembering who you are because of what Jesus did when you bring your gift to the altar do you, do you just set it there or do you make it right with the person that you're wrong with before you do it I'm here to get in your heart buddy why? Because God doesn't want some kind of revival that ends. God wants one that never ends, that the rule of God's government can cover the earth. But he needs a bride that's holy because the Bible says that the bride has made herself ready. The Bible doesn't say that the... The Bible doesn't say Jesus made the bride ready. The Bible says the bride has made herself ready. If Jesus came back right now, what would he say to you? Well done. I don't know if you know it or not, but it could be trumpet time any second. The trumpet could blow any second. That's not okay for guilt, shame, condemnation, regret to be in your life because it stops you from being the person God created you to be. This is heavy stuff. I can feel conviction. I love it. I, I need to be convicted. I want to live with conviction. I ask the Lord to bring conviction. Intensify conviction in my life. Why? Because when conviction comes, condemnation can never come. When you don't obey convictions, it's when you just want to have your cake and eat it too. You will not escape what I'm talking about. I promise you. I promise. You could, you could bail right now and say, that guy's a legalist. Or you could believe that this is all scripture. Jesus didn't take the Old Testament and throw it away. <laughs> Are you with me? He didn't. He actually upped it. He says pornography is adultery. You know, it says do not commit adultery. And we're like, wow, well, I never did that. Okay. Have you ever looked lustfully with your eyes? Is that thing fixed in you or do you still have a problem with it? Because God sees everything. He sits in the theater room of your soul and watches everything that goes across your screen. So are you really free from that? Because people don't believe you can be. I talk to pastors that don't believe they can be free because they've taught they can't be free. Well, how can we expect people to be free if we're teaching from the pulpit that you can't be free? How can we expect? How can we expect? How do you get out of Romans 6? Therefore, reckon yourself dead to sin. What? Can we be dead to it? Could it be that we haven't entered into a place of intimacy in that place of prayer where God wants us to be because we don't believe we're clean? Are you guys okay? It's not a lot of response and a lot of faces looking at me like, holy goodness. God's holiness is good. Do you know when the, when the people, when God, when God told Moses, bring the people to the mountain, do you know that like, the people like came, but then God spoke. And you know the people like freaked out. They said, if he keeps talking to us, we're gonna die. 
We can't do this, Moses. You talk to God, and then we'll listen to you. God never wanted that. He wanted to put his fear inside of us. Are you with me? Like, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to put his fear inside of us so that we could all live with the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is in so in love and awestruck reverence with the king that nothing else bargains for first place. Oh, I can feel the Holy Ghost. You just, this is exciting to me because it is the truth. This Bible proclaims this truth. It proclaims this. Peter, the one that people say they can relate to, quoted a scripture once he was born again and filled with the Spirit. He said, be holy even as he is holy. The Bible says, 1 John says, if anybody has this hope in him, he ought purify himself just as he is pure. The Bible says if somebody says that, that they love him, if somebody says they abide in him, they ought walk just as Jesus walked. The Bible says, it, come on, in 1 John 4, it's, as he is, so are we in this world. That's exciting. Remember, because everybody looks at Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And they look that he healed all that were oppressed by the devil. But let's not forget, he went about doing good. Doing good. Living good, living pure, living holy. Do you think that God doesn't see all the other stuff? Oh my gosh, he's like amazing. But the quicker you see that he sees it, is the quicker you stop living that way. Do you know, sometimes, sometimes this stuff is preached and we think, God, there's just no way. I mean, my life's out of order. No, no, no. Do you know that God knew that you couldn't do it because he wanted to put his fear inside of the children? He knew they couldn't do it. He knew that they had an ingredient that they couldn't conjure up themselves. That God actually wanted to be the main ingredient inside of your life so that that would come inside of you, possess you from inside out, and keep you from ever wanting to do the junk. Because you would be so in love and awestruck reverence from the Father. Come on, Isaiah 6, guys. Isaiah. Man, he sees the Lord. He sees him. High and lifted up. He sees him. Oh, Isaiah's like, oh, boom. Come on, he falls like a dead man. Are you with me? This is crazy. He says, get up. Oh, get up. You're in the presence of the Lord. And the train of his robe filled the temple. It kept on filling. It kept on filling. It was so overwhelming that he couldn't even stand. Come on. And a cherubim comes and a seraphim. Touches a coal to his lips. <sighs> Whoa! I am a man of unclean lips amongst an unclean people. Woe is me! That's what an encounter with the Lord does. <laughs> Everybody's like, I encountered the Lord. Really? <laughs> See, he's coming. I'm not kidding. Those that want this, he's coming. Uh, here, tonight, he's coming. I'm not kidding. Like, I've been in this before. I know what I'm feeling. I know where I'm at. I know what's happening right now. It's his truth, line upon line, precept upon precept. For anyone who's hungry, he's coming. I am not joking. I'm talking about not just being touched. I'm talking about being branded. I'm talking about being branded by the Lord in such a way to where you don't get up the same. <laughs> People are like, well, I don't know if I want that. Stay full of you. It's fine. Just when you stand before him, do you think that like somebody that doesn't do stuff, like it, un unwillful is the same. Like your ignorance doesn't stop this from happening. God's told you to look through his word. He said to put it before you all the days of your life. He told you to, to completely study this and show yourself approved.
He didn't say study and preach yourself approved. He said study to show yourself approved, meaning my life is completely and sincerely in love with him, every part of my being. Nothing is going to be hidden. Do you understand that on that day, nothing's hidden? Wouldn't you like for nothing to be hidden now so that each day you're going through a day with nothing hidden? Again, nothing hidden again, nothing hidden again. No hidden agenda, no weird stuff. There are people that press in to get into ministry because they want to be in front of people and want to have a pulpit. Think that that won't be judged. Oh my, listen, there's levels of judgment. Do you know that he who's given much, much is required. The more you press in, the more that's required of you. You're bringing yourself to a greater accountability. I wish I didn't come to this meeting tonight. That's my job as a preacher, as a minister, to bring people to a greater awareness, to a greater accountability. Why? Because everything that comes out of my mouth, I will be judged for. My gosh, this is like the most dangerous position on the planet if you're not truly in love and selfless here. Because you will be judged for everything that you've ever said. I can train people in the miraculous and live my whole life just teaching people how to pray for the sick. And, and man, I'm still going to be judged for the entirety of this thing. People are like, what do you mean judgment? Man, you keep talking judgment. Why you said we, we're under grace? We are. We're in a mercy place right now. Mercy gives you a chance to repent. Judgment, it's over. It's game over. This life is a dressing room for eternity. <laughs> this life is a dressing room for eternity. When what you don't know is that I was scheduled to be somewhere. I was scheduled to be in a very large gathering. But the Holy Spirit shifted things. And I, instead of being in a gathering with 15,000 people, I'm in a church. God shifted things for a reason. There's a purpose for this. I'm not kidding. Like this is real, real, real stuff. Pastor Mike knows what I'm talking about. This is real. Like this isn't a, oh wow, Todd could fill in. This isn't that. This isn't that. This is something's going on. What's up? There, it's way more than that. I, I wasn't planning on being here until, but I'm here now because God has something to say. Not that I'm the only voice. I'm not. I just have stepped in. Listen, what I'm talking about has come through a tremendous crushing, a tremendous Everything going wrong. Everything. I'm not talking about a little bit. I'm talking about everything going wrong in the last couple of years. Like one thing after another. Stuff that you couldn't even imagine. To top it off, my, my heart was hit. I was at 20% ejection fraction. The devil tried to kill me. The doctors told me that I'm going to be on medication for the rest of my life. Like, I'm talking everything, because this is always on my heart, the things that I'm sharing right now. So the devil tried to take everything out, clean sweep across the whole platform, everything. Ministry, health, family, everything. You guys don't know that. You don't need to, but you need to know that it happened. And I was at 20% ejection fraction. The doctors told me that you need a defibrillator. You're not going to make it. You're going to be on 14 medications. I, I'm on all these meds. At the same time, my wife gets hit with massive tumors in her uterus that came out of nowhere. Multiple tumors. Like the devil's not playing a game. Like he wants to kill you. Do you understand? He wants to stop the message of righteousness. He wants to stop the message of holiness. But he couldn't kill me. You don't understand. This is really big. Really big, 14 medicines, 14 medications. The doctors are like freaking out on me, telling me that I'm a lunatic. And I said, no, I am not out of my mind. I'm out of yours. I'm into his. And Jesus is my sustainer. He's my sustainer. God loves me. Well, he loves me too. I get it, but you're a Christian in your heart, but you're an atheist in your mind, doc. You're a doctor, but Jesus is the great physician. And I'm thankful that you've helped me. I did 60 days of meds. I felt like I was on drugs again, totally sedated, doing like bed rest, everything. My wife, at night, she's putting her hand on my chest to make sure I'm still alive. It was that bad. It was that intense. I'm on every amiodarone, blood thinners, blood pressure, you name it, I'm on it. And it's all toxic. It's all toxic medication. 
and I've never had a physical problem like that in my life, but out of nowhere, boom, nowhere. They did the calf, all my arteries are crystal clean, and there's nothing in my arteries. I work out, I train. No, I'm talking when it was happening, they did the calf, just to see. They're like, we don't understand, it must be a COVID attack. I said, it's the devil. They said, well, look, you might say sickness games. I said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil. Doc, you can call it what you want. Well, the earth has been here for billions of years. I knew you weren't a Christian. <laughs> no, I'm talking serious intensity. Because when you're in that place, you better believe the truth. You better believe the gospel. You better not have junk in your life. You better not have offense in your heart, buddy. Offense kills so many people. Living in a place of offended. I'm offended. They shouldn't have done this. They shouldn't have done that. Man, we get offended because somebody in the church hurt us. That's the number one hurt right there. Somebody in the church. They treated us wrong. They did something. A pastor cheated on his wife with somebody. So then people leave the church because they had their eyes on a person and not Jesus. You can say what you want and do what you want. Your pastor is not supposed to be your link to God. Jesus is. So what happens is we, we might not even settle at a church. We go from place to place because we've been hurt. So now we're going to get hurt again. Why? Because we're looking to see if they love us. And if no one comes up to you quick enough, to tell you that they love you, obviously it's not a place of love, so you go to another place. Finally, you leave the church completely. You end up in some wound-licking wound -licking house club that is at people's houses that we don't need the church, we got our thing, and you talk about your great wounds and your great hurt. And one day you're going to stand before Jesus and answer for your little life that should have been big. Well, I don't like how you're preaching. Well, maybe you should drop the house group. People hate this. Like, hey, I mean, we don't need the church. We got our own thing. Really? What are you going to send people? They're going to get saved and come to your club? You're going to hate the bride that Jesus paid a price for? All because the leader didn't know who they were? And you got hurt by it? They didn't know who they were, so they gave it to you. You didn't know who you were, so you got hurt by it. So if they didn't know and you didn't know, well, you both were, didn't know. So I think it's time we find out and know. You can't afford to let sin against you produce sin within you. Because your within needs changed and you need to see people through a different lens. Stop being offended and let Jesus have your heart. Stop letting that stuff rule your life. You can't live a Christian life if you live in offense. You can't. Men, you can come up with all the reasons why they need to repent. No. What if they don't know how to? Man, glad Jesus didn't do that to you. My gosh, he just loved you anyway. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He didn't require everybody to say, oh my gosh, all these ways I've messed up. That's not how it happens. The goodness of God hits a person. And all of a sudden that goodness leads them to repentance. Maybe their freedom depends upon your forgiveness. This is good preaching. Oh, it is, because it'll set you free. A bunch of you, I can see it in your eyes, like, oh. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I was stung. No, the great news is that you won't be able to go to sleep and get away from this. Because it's the truth, and the words that I'm speaking become both spirit and life. Because they're in line with the truth of God's gospel. And I don't have junk in my closet. So when I'm preaching it, I'm preaching it from a pure heart. I'm not preaching it from somebody that has some agenda. I don't have an agenda. My agenda is that you would fall in love with Jesus and you'd, you'd get out of this junk. Fall in love with Jesus and burn brightly again and, and come to that place called first love. Come to that place where to he who overcomes, to he who overcomes, to he who overcomes. Look at Revelation, to he who overcomes. He didn't say to he who's overcome. You guys all right? Okay. Because he said I'd go all night. No, he didn't say that, but I got the green light still. Red light up there, but green light right now. I love you. I want to see you rocked by the gospel. I want to see you return.
to your first love. I want to see every bit of junk that you had in your life, that you have in your life presently that's trying. Look, when I'm preaching this way, there are all kinds of voices that y'all are hearing right now. I'm not kidding. If I took a show of hands of who's hearing little voices, it would be a majority. Because the stranger's a liar. He's the father of lies. So all those little lies are, yeah, but he doesn't know what you've been through. He doesn't know how they treated you. Well, if he only knew your situation, he wouldn't say that stuff. It's okay. It's all right. That's the devil, man. You think that stuff's going to fly when Jesus comes? You better get rid of it before that. I promise you. I would hate to have that stuff in my life. Well, you know, Jesus, they shouldn't have treated me that way. Some people are like, when I get to see the Lord, I have a couple questions for him. You'll be lucky if you don't get up for a thousand years. If you just lay in a puddle of tears and find out that it was all about you. You lay on the ground, worthy, worthy is the lamb. All your questions are gone. You will see that selfishness hid you from the reality of the truth that you could have walked in. You will find that the way that seems right to a man bound you and kept you when that is supposed to be crushed off your life. But there is only one way, and it's righteousness, and it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. So Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down, and I will give you rest. Then he says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come on, that's what he says. Learn from me, Jesus says. He didn't say learn from a prophet. He didn't say learn from a teacher. And although we have teachers and prophets and pastors and evangelists, and it's not wrong to have the five-fold gift because we're supposed to, but you need to learn from Jesus. Why? Because learning from Jesus is the only way you'll realize you're a saint. A saint and a sinner are two different things. Before you got saved, you were a sinner. Got saved by grace through faith. And once you got saved, he translated you and made you a saint in his eyes. And saint means holy one set apart. A holy one set apart by the Lord. Holy and set apart. That means that you and the world are different. You have nothing to do with the world nor the world with you. You are absolutely, you've come out and you become separate. You've separated yourself. Now, if you don't learn from Jesus, you'll never learn and understand what divine separation really means. And you'll incorporate Jesus in for what you can get from him for the benefits, but you'll never live holy and pure like the gospel says you can. And you will call people that preach like I'm preaching legalists. Well, you're going to answer for your life accusing me of a legalist. Because this isn't legalism. This is just the gospel. It's the good news. The one that says you can be free, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. Like, holiness is actually pretty amazing. It's actually really pure. You know what holiness does? Gets you to sleep in 30 seconds, baby. <laughs> holiness gets you to sleep in 30 seconds. When it's time to go to bed, 30 seconds later, you're out. Why? Because there's no junk in your closet. Holiness, you get to look in the mirror and be like, ooh, I see you in there, and you're happy about that. Right. Holiness is when every accusation goes, man, I got so many people that hate me and accuse me. Bring it. Right. What are you to me? My father says I'm right with him. So if he's accepted me, you can't reject me. You might come against me and say that I'm too strong. You might say that I'm too bold. You might say that I'm... You know, I'm just spouting off. You're too loud. You're this. No, I'm passionate. It's been 19 years almost of me being in love with Jesus. People told me that I couldn't preach this way. I couldn't talk this way. You need to chill out, man. Listen, we don't want you to be like that seed on the rocket. But all of a sudden, you don't have enough root. And all of a sudden, that thing's burn up. And how can you be burning out if you're burning up? It's because we truly aren't on fire for the Lord. We're on fire for selfish purposes. I'm on fire for people to like me. That's a twisted life. You only tell people what they like to hear. You'll keep people comfortable. You can build huge things if you just allow people to teach them a little bit, be a great teacher, and allow them to be comfortable and do nothing with the gospel. You guys all right? Oh, this is good. He's a good God. He's amazing. 
Ooh, he's beautiful. Look, let's go to the Bible real quick. I, take you, I took you there a lot, but... <laughs> you guys good? Okay. Gosh, I love to be free. I love freedom. I love to preach the gospel of freedom that set me free, that's kept me free. And I've not brought anything in to be bondage in my life. Man, I was hooked on every, I was hooked on drugs, pornography. I was hooked on everything my whole life. It ruled me. It ruled me. I thought that's what made me a man. That doesn't make you a man. God makes you a man. God makes you a man. Isaiah 11, 2. Now, I said, how many of you want to be like Jesus? It says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. One. The spirit of wisdom. Two. Spirit of understanding. Three. Spirit of counsel. Four. Spirit of might. Five. Of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Six and seven. A sevenfold spirit rested upon Jesus. I want you to see this. This is so powerful. And it says this in verse three. He shall delight in the fear of the Lord. Oh. Jesus' delight was the fear of the Lord. He could have delighted in the power, the counsel. He could have delighted in everything, anything. But his delight was in the fear of the Lord. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the only thing that can keep you clean. The fear of the Lord is what enables you to have the lamp of your first love that burns with holy fear. The fear of the Lord is everything. The fear of the Lord is what Isaiah 6 talked about. It's being touched with God, God touching you. But we're not looking, guys, we're not looking for just a visitation. We don't want just a visit. We want a habitation. We want to become the habitation of God to where God sets up his camp here and Jesus sits in the theater room of your soul and he watches everything that goes across your screen and you're consciously aware of that. Are you guys okay? Are you sure? Okay, go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. How many of you like the new creation scripture? Nobody. Okay. Let's start over. It's not a trick. I'm not tricking you. Oh my gosh. He's so good. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to check this out with me. I'm going to read from verse 1 and just read in a little bit, okay? You guys okay? All right. For we know if our earthly house, this tent, were to, to be destroyed, we have an eternal building of God in the heavens, a house not made with hands. In this one we groan, er, earnestly desiring to be sheltered or to be clothed with our house that's from heaven. And thus being clothed, we shall not be found unclothed. For we, are not, for, we, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we wish to be unclothed, but further clothed so that what is mortal might be swallowed up by light. And we know and understand that that is, you know, us leaving this world and entering in there, right? Okay. This is so good. Now, he who has created us for this very thing is God, who has given to us the guarantee of the Spirit. Therefore, we're always confident, knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Instead, I say that we are confident and willing to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So whether absent or present or present or absent, we may be acceptable to him. Okay, I'm going to read another translation. You guys all right? Just bear with me here. Oh. Oh. Huh. You guys good? Okay, sorry. I just, I love going through different translations. I had a lady tonight in a uh, place that I went. She's like, well, I just don't, you know, I'm a Christian. I love God, but I don't believe the Bible. I'm like, well, help me understand that. 
She goes, well, there's just too many different translations. So I shared with her and she went, oh, it was really good. It only took like two minutes and she felt really wrong. <laughs> Not because I made her feel bad, because I shared the truth of scripture, being inspired by God, breathed by God. I shared the Greek and the Hebrew and she was like, wow. And her back and her feet got healed. Amen. It was really, it was really fun. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. Verse 6. So we're always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yet well pleased, to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Knowing, like we're talking about, if this tent is put off to be present with the Lord, Jesus paid a price to get heaven into us, right? So that we could destroy hell for a living. First John 3, 8, for this reason Jesus was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Your manifestation here is the same exact mission. Your mission is to destroy hell for a living. It's hard to destroy hell for a living if it's in your life. You're compromised, therefore you can't destroy it. You're being destroyed by it. Did you guys hear me over there? Okay. <laughs> All right. Therefore, listen to this. This is New Testament. Judgment seat of Christ. Great language. Great stuff. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Question. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? We're talking about the day that you die. Like, like, I love this. This is my favorite example. Like, People threaten me, they're gonna kill me, they, I get all this stuff, I'm like, oh no, please, not that. <laughs> like, oh no. Like, anything but kill me. Like, please. Like, it's gonna be like this. <clears throat> no, I want you to see this. When you die, no matter what it is, no matter how, good, no matter how it happens, whatever, it's, <clears throat> it's like that. No, no, I want, you to, I want you to get this. You need to get this. No, did you get that? Did you see it? Like you die and you're immediately present. Like when you die, as soon as you die, you're absent from the body. You know they weigh people that have died in 22 ounces leaves? They've literally done studies. When a person dies, they're 22 ounces lighter. Everyone. It's the same amount. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you die, it's boom, you're there, it's over. Like this is a dressing room for eternity. But because the way that seems right to a man has groomed our souls, the enemy hides in the way that seems right to a man and calls it normal. We say things like, chill out man, I'm only human. When Jesus told Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is full of the things of man instead of the things of God. So we say, chill out, I'm only human, is to say, back off, I'm only demonic. We call it normal because we're groomed by the way that seems right to a man. We've lived it our whole life. Whether you were born in the church or not, the only one that can take the way that seems right to you out is the Holy Ghost. And then it comes from learning to Jesus because you're yoked with him. He is meek and lowly. And when you learn from him, you find rest for your soul. He gives you rest when you get born again. You learn from him and you have rest here. Then you sleep in 30 seconds. 
because you don't have any junk in your closet and there's no hidden secrets. There's, imagine not having anything hidden that God, you know, sees everything and there's nobody that could, imagine if you had a microphone on 24 hours a day and everybody could hear you. Like as a pastor, like, be like, hey man, your mic's on. You go to the bathroom, you're like, oh, dude. <laughs> Usually I'm praying in tongues, so that's all you'd hear. I'm serious. But people are like, oh man, your mic was on. But, but you shouldn't be saying stuff that you couldn't say in front of anybody, everybody anyway. Yeah. But what if your heart was convicted and it couldn't come out because your heart was changed? Yes. That's what I'm talking about. This is not something that everybody's like, yay, praise God, that's what I'm looking for. No, because the way that seems right to a man has so indoctrinated the church. And we call it normal and we're looking for revival, but the reality of it is repentance brings revival like and when your heart is clean and you're walking with God and you're going after Jesus like revival happens every day of your life because there's no junk in your closet you're not trying to impress anybody because you know that you're loved by the Father God's love is crisp and clear and clean and all of a sudden you know that you're loved by the Father so you don't need the praise and stroking of people anymore because you're loved by the Father like you are in love with God and He's in love with you and that's what matters and you're excited about it and everybody's like you're a freak and you're like yup doesn't matter accuse all you want man I get all the accusations ever I went through hell on earth the last few years and nobody else was my problem. You could say what you want, do what you want. I went through that stuff with my heart. Man, I went 60 days in and, and the, the medicines weren't doing it. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to do a 40-day water fast, Todd. I want you to come off of all your meds. Tell me that that won't drive the doctor crazy. <laughs> crazy, because he's like, just keep taking your medicine. I said, I really, really appreciate your help, buddy, but I'm coming off all your meds. I gave you 60 days. Didn't work. He's like, no, you need a defibrillator. You're going to be on medicines for the rest of your life. I said, oh, buddy, listen, listen, listen quick. I know you think I'm crazy, but in 40 days, I'm going without water. You won't make it. You'll die. We'll see. I'm doing it. Well, you, you can't just, you can't even live a week without medicines. We'll see. I'll call you in seven days. So I did a week. He wouldn't answer my call. I did two weeks. Wouldn't answer my call. Three weeks. Text. Nothing. Four weeks. Nothing. No reminder of appointments. Nothing. Like he's crazy. He's out of his mind. Five weeks. Oh my gosh. What are you going to do? Well, with 35 days in, I got five more days to go. My wife is hoping that like I'm not, I've not lost it. Because I'm, I'm, I am, I freak with Jesus. Like you don't understand. Like, I, my wife has to live with me. You guys just to see this like once in a while. My wife sees this every day. I do not negotiate. I do not compromise. I don't play any games. I'm not playing a game. I will not compromise. I will not lie. I will not bend the truth. I will not lightly skim over it. I'm going to tell the truth every day of my life. I am not serving the father of lies. When I lie, I partner with hell. I don't care what you call it. There's no little white lie. It's all from hell. Every bit of it is twisted. All of it is twisted. All of it. I won't do it. So 40 days in, I went back into the doctors. 41 days in, I said, give me an eco. Give me an echo. Give me a, one of them eco echoes. <laughs> I went and had my echo done. 100% healed. 30, 31 pounds down. I'm like... Well, we're done here. Oh, no, buddy. We're not done here. He goes, I, I don't know what to say. I said, well, how about this? Jesus loves you, buddy, and you really don't know him like you said you do. It's great to meet you. I said, well, uh, 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 No. Come on. I'm a Holy Ghost antagonist. I'm not kidding. Like, I know the truth. The truth is what set me free. But the truth set me free from you. So I don't have to tell you things to make you happy. I need to preach the truth which pleases the Lord. Because the Lord is pleased when we preach the truth. See, one day I'm going to answer for this meeting right here. 
I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, that was great. I actually have that that is great right now already. Like I can feel him. He's, I don't normally feel him, but I do. Because he's like, he wants to, he wants to overwhelm your soul with the truth. He wants you to be free. So check this out. Whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing for him. How can I possibly be pleasing to him? Here, it's over. I mean, it's over. Like when you stand before the Lord, it's over. You're before this. Listen to this. It says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Wait a minute. I passed judgment. Oh, you did. Here. You did. Judgment. Like, you know there's people that have those tattoos, only God can judge me? That came from some leader somewhere making someone mad, so they went and got a tattoo because they wanted to live a life of sin and no one can tell them it's wrong. <laughs> let, me, let me say that again. People get tattoos that says only God can judge me because somebody somewhere told them that what they were doing was wrong so they continued in a life of sin and got the tattoo boasting in the tattoo you have no ability to speak into my life only God will and on that day when you stand before him your tattoo doesn't mean squat why, why else would you get a tattoo unless you were offended come on man the only reason you will leave right now. I'm not kidding. I'm not citing you. I'm telling you that we've gotten offended and you made a wrong decision. And you said that only God can judge you, but the Bible says that we judge those that are in the house. We don't judge the world because the world has nothing to do with this. We keep each other accountable. If something's wrong, we speak the truth in love. That's not judgment. That's, hey, if you keep going down that road, it's going to kill you. Yeah, well, you judge me. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You don't read your Bible. The only way that you would say you're judging me is you don't read your Bible. You've let the pastor read the Bible for you. Do you know that Peter says, desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby? Like, we have to grow. Like, when somebody has a baby, that baby has to have some nutrients. So the bottle, or like we say in my house, my wife doesn't like it, but I say it, the mama booba. You either breastfeed or bottle feed. It is what it is. When my baby would cry, it's so sad because my daughters would be in the meeting and I go, Briley, my 12 year old should get up. Oh, dad, not again. See, when you cried and I knew I couldn't fix it, I handed you to mama so mama could give you the booba. <laughs> because when the baby drinks milk, like you can pacify that baby with a, with a, you guys, all right, some of you are looking at me like, did he just say booba? I did. <laughs> I'm talking about breastfeeding or bottle feeding. The baby has to have the bottle to grow. But the baby can only grow so much with the bottle. Like there comes a time when you switch the bottle to food. And you have to have that food. And then it goes from that slimy whatever, it's nasty, to noodles, to some fruit, to some Cheerios, right? And then, we, and then we're talking about meat. And the Bible is very clear that we need to grow thereby to desire the milk, but because a large majority of the body of Christ doesn't desire the pure spiritual milk, they're still, feed, they're still feeding on the world. And now that they're feeding on the world, the world's feeding feeds the way that seems right to a man. So all of a sudden, their soul isn't transformed. Their soul remains the same. Their spirit is born again, but their mind hasn't been renewed. So when somebody preaches something like this, they can call me a legalist because they don't read the word and understand that I'm not preaching legalism. I'm preaching love. I'm preaching love. 
Did Jesus say or did he not say? I had a relative that was that in an immorality relationship. And she came to my house. She was like, don't you tell me that God doesn't love me. Hi. Are you coming to give me a hug? I'm coming down there. Come here. <laughs> Bless you. Love you. Five. Thank you. What's your name? Riley. Riley? Yeah. Briley? That's the same as my daughter's name. Yeah. That's amazing. When I said Briley, you came up here? What? <laughs> it's a blessing to meet you. Can I get one more hug? Come here. I love you. Bless you. Yay! You can stay up here with me if you want. I'm going to preach. Amen. Preacher, watch and see. No joke. God is faithful. She's okay. You don't have to move her. It's all right. Jesus said, let the little kids come. And it's all right. Unless you don't want it. And it's okay. Either way. She's all right. I'm not going to run her over. It's okay. Uh, she said to me, she goes, don't you try it. Because she was in an immoral lifestyle. And she knows what I preach. She knows what I believe. And when she got around me, she felt judged. Although I'd never said anything to her. So she said to me, don't you try to tell me that God doesn't love me. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm not. It's impossible for God not to love you. He loves you. Scripture says, he who loves me obeys my commandments. You prove by your life that you don't love God, you love yourself. That's not being mean and that's not being legal. That's being scripturally true. People are like, well, I don't, I don't, you know, we don't have to walk the commandments out. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, he who loves me obeys the commandments. That's like pretty simple, right? That's amazing. And she goes, well, and I showed her. She goes, well, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that you're trying to feed yourself because you're lonely. So you're thinking because you're lonely, if you fill this void, you're going to be okay. But when this one's done, it'll be another one. And then it'll be another one. And then it'll be another one. And it will never fill a void that only Jesus can fill. So you can make a choice. You can either have Jesus be the fulfillment of the void or you can live the way that you're living and you can always be separated from God. She chose to join to be with God. That was great. But she thought because of that. Listen, I got to the hotel the other night. Pastor Mike dropped me off. I go in and I walk up to my room and I came back down because um, he was going to drop some water off from me. Because I drink a lot of water. I, I have six waters left. I drank almost a case of water. I mean, today, all my water left me. I had to put it back in me. And that's a lot of water. I went out and played golf today. Do you know what today was like? Wow. It's Texas. I'm used to it because I live in Texas. We live in Dallas, Fort Worth. The guy came up to me. He's running after me. And I'm like, oh, wow. I don't know what it's going to be. So he's either coming up to come against me or he's coming up to talk to me. So he, so he comes up to me and he goes, hey man, he goes, you're Todd, right? He goes, I saw you coming down the elevator. I knew it was you, man. I knew it. He goes, I'm in sin. I lost God. And I, I can't find him. I go, oh, bro, I love you, man. He goes, yeah. He goes, I will you talk to me? I go, oh my God, I'd love to talk to you. Jesus loves you so much. And he dropped my water off and I said, I'll be right back. I got to get my water. I said, don't you move. Don't go anywhere. He goes, I'm not going nowhere. And he's got tears in his eyes. He goes, what do I do, man? I've given myself to stuff, to this, the other stuff. I said, well, if you didn't want to be free, you wouldn't have came after me because you know what I preach. So if he didn't want freedom, he definitely wouldn't have told me. And if it was a demon, he wouldn't have came up to me. I'm the last person a demon comes up to, I promise you. Someone comes up, help me, I have a devil. No, you don't. You wouldn't have came to me, I promise. <laughs> you wouldn't have. Give me some. Uh. You wouldn't have came to me, bro. He's, he's like, you know, I, I just, what do I do? I said, repent. He was, I got into stuff, like, I'm married, I got this, I got that. Repent, bro. Repent. What does that look like? 
what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized. The times of refreshing will come from the Lord. All these people were cut to the heart. He said, men and brethren, what do we do? Repent. That's what he said. So this guy repented. And I prayed for him. He goes, whoa, dude. That's amazing. I said, he loves you. He goes, yeah. He loves me. I said, he does. And I'm so proud of you, bro. It was really, really good. Really good. I got to go up there again, okay? I got to go read something, all right? But you can stay right here, okay? You know what? Oh, I'll just bring it down here. <laughs> all right. He says, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be pleasing to him. What you do here is the only way you can be pleasing there. How you live here is the only way that your life is pleasing when you get there. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in his body knowing uh, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore, listen to this, the terror of the Lord. Very rarely do we hear terror. Is that dad? Are you, are you dad? Okay, good. All right. I didn't know. One day, it'll happen. Amen. <laughs> Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men but are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. So knowing the terror of the Lord, very... Okay. Oh, oh don't be sorry. It's okay. I love babies. It's okay. I've got five. <laughs> I do. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but are well known to God. God wants to put in us the reality of what it means to know the terror of the Lord. Yes. See, God is good. I, I need you to understand. What I'm preaching doesn't have to do with God not being good. You have to know this. But let us not forget that there's goodness and severity at the same time. What we've done, what we've done is we've preached God's goodness without severity. So God is good and God is love and God is okay with anything. And, but lots of sermons are preached from pulpits that the Lord... The Lord will meet you and take you just as you are. But it's true. He'll take you just as you are. But grace demands change. Right. Yeah. Grace without transformation is demonic. Yes. Yeah. Amen. And I know this isn't a church that preaches that. I know that. There's no, it's not like that. I'm not in a crowd that, that just lives lackadaisical and it's okay. But I'm telling you that if the fire isn't burning, it's because you've allowed junk in your life. And there's stuff in your life that God wants to remove. And it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Yes. I, I promise you. See, tonight, what I believe is going to happen is there's going to be a fresh filling of the Holy Ghost. I believe there's going to be a fresh baptism of fire available for you that are hungry. I believe this. I've seen it over and over again lately. Since all that stuff, see, when all that stuff happens and everything just hits hard and everybody turns and all kinds of stuff comes against you, if you don't defend yourself, if you stay in a place of saying, what can I learn in this situation instead of what everybody's doing to you and they're all wrong, what can I learn? How can I grow? Lord, what can, you, what can I see here that I didn't see before so that I know and understand when something like this comes? What can I learn out of this situation to be able to be? Like, like do you remember the time when, in Zig, when Ziglag, when David and all the guys went to Ziglag and they attacked? And they went there and they had like great victory. And when they get back, all of their wives and kids have been taken. Like, I'm talking David's mighty men. Like, these guys were trained by David. They're like warriors, not warriors. Warriors. They come back after they've won this battle. When they get back, their wives and their kids have been captured. And all of David's warriors turned against David. 
and wanted to stone and kill him. And it says this in there, David strengthened himself in the Lord. So when all hell broke out and everything came against David, all these guys that he had trained, he trained up all these amazing men. They just came back from great victories. David's, David's family was captured too. All of them were captured. And it says David strengthened himself in the Lord when everybody wanted to kill him. There is something so powerful in that that you can strengthen yourself. But if you've got junk in your closet and something like that happens, you're done. You will be offended. It will be everybody else's fault. You will learn nothing except you will cut everybody off, start brand new again. The same thing happens again. So we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. But how can you strengthen yourself in the Lord if your heart's not abandoned and pure before Him? Oh, gosh. One more, and then we're going to pray. Sorry. Gosh, I love this so much. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. One more. Go to Isaiah 51. Actually, no. Hold on. Psalm 51. Sorry, that was bad. That was wrong. I love this. You know, David, like David had that thing with Bathsheba and and the, and the baby died, are you with me? And then, you know the sin that David got into? It was horrible, horrible stuff. David went down in history as a man that was after God's heart. He did, he had a great immoral failure. Like it was, this was huge. I mean, David's on a rooftop, he sees Bathsheba. David goes, he's a king, he can have anybody he wants, but he wants someone else's wife. David has her called to the room, he sleeps with her. Bathsheba gets pregnant. To cover his sin, David's gonna like bring Uriah home. He's gonna come home and hopefully he's gonna get him drunk and he's gonna sleep with his wife so his sin can be covered. Uriah's an amazing man. He's like burning for, for God, for he's going after, like he's a warrior. He won't even sleep with his wife. He sleeps outside. He's not going into bed with her. Why? My men are out in the field. I'm not doing this. So he doesn't do it. And he's like, are you guys with me? So he's not. So David tries it again. Nothing happens. So Uriah goes back to war. He sends a message to the commander and says, you know what? Put him at the front where the battle is the worst and then draw back from him and he'll be killed. So all of a sudden it happens. The guy that's, he's like, you know, feels bad. The commander feels bad. Like this is wrong. He's look, it happens. That's what happens in war. So like he tries to cover it. Doesn't cover it for long. God's man, Nathan, He's there, he comes to David, he goes, you know, did you ever see Veggie Tales? <laughs> it's so good. This man had a little lamb. It's just a, it's a great story, but you've got this, he's like, he gives this story about this man that had all these sheep and, and, and he had everything he could choose from, but he sees a neighbor that only has one, and instead of choosing his own, he goes to the neighbor and he takes the sheep and he says to David, he said, who's? What should happen to this man? And David, filled with indignation, filled with anger, says, this man should be killed. And Nathan says, you're the man. You talk about conviction. David thinks that he hit it. And for a small season, he got away from God knowing everything. Because that whole thing from being in the head or being the leader can get to your head and all of a sudden you think that everything's okay. Oh, no, no, no. Your stuff will find you out. I don't care who you are. Your stuff will find you out, especially when you start pressing into kingdom and you start pressing into miracles. You start pressing into healing. Like the stakes are up because now you're leading other people. Now people are watching you. Now people are listening to you. You've actually got the ear of people. You better have the heart of the Lord. And so Nathan's like, you know, he confronts David David's like, I'm so sorry, what should I do? Well, your son's gonna die. Like, it's an awful time. 
Listen to this. Now, the whole psalm is good, but I want to draw your attention just to, to verse 10. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, we know that God's not going to take his Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's not, we're in, a, we're in the new covenant. The Holy Spirit's not going to be taken from us. But you can grieve him. You can grieve him. Are you with me? Like, this is a big deal. So he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Here's what he says. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. Why? This is what he says. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Do you know that when you get saved and everything's brighter and everything's more beautiful and the sky is bluer and all of a sudden everything's so exciting, we're like, this is so amazing, oh my gosh, and then life comes. Then all of a sudden that this is so amazing gets a little more dull and duller and duller. And we might have some glimpses of, wow, that was awesome. Man, that song moved me. Man, I got goosebumps. Wow, I love that. But honestly, we lose our worship. Because what happens is we'll be in a great worship service, or, but you're not connecting because the joy of the Lord has left you. The joy of your salvation has left you and you can't find joy anymore. So all of a sudden we bring other stuff in to try to get joy, but the world can't satisfy what only the Lord can do. So all of a sudden we're, we're getting this and we're growing in feeding on the world. We've become a lover of the world instead of a lover of God, but we still go through the motions of church. And all of a sudden our flame just flickers a little bit more dim, a little bit more dim, a little bit more dim. But God wants to restore the joy of your salvation. He wants to renew a right spirit within you. He wants to get all the junk out of your house. Like Jesus, when he came into the temple, right? When he came in there, came with a three-strand cord, he starts flipping over tables and stuff. Like that is a picture of what Jesus wants to do inside of this temple. Like he wants to make your house a house of prayer again. So it doesn't have to be a house of praying once in a while. He wants you to pray without ceasing. He wants to restore the lamp of your first love so you can burn with holy fire. God wants to, and here's why. He says, uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will be converted to you. He, he wants you to burn with holy fire so that everywhere you go, your life becomes a conviction. So when you walk into a room, happens to me, we we'll go to conferences, I go to places, people know what I preach. Like if we're in the back room, if I'm in the green room, they're joking around, I come up, they stop joking. Because they're, hey, hey, here comes Don. Hey, brother. Oh, I'm not kidding. I'm not welcome back to a lot of different places because of that. That's one cute baby. I'm not welcome back to a lot of places. I, it doesn't matter to me. When someone's there talking about somebody else, I'm going to confront them. Why? Because that's what Jesus would do. I'm not going to confront him in, every, in front of everybody else. I get invited to pastor. I go to ple preach at a church. And then I'm like in the room talking to pastor after he, and he's talking about somebody in the room. And I'm like, pastor, could I have a minute with you? And people leave the room. I'm like, hey, you can't do that. What? Like, He's above. I'm not saying, not Pastor Mike. I'm saying it's happened. No, I'm being serious. I'm not here to like sit there and allow people to live in sin, in leadership. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? But this is what's kept me clean for 19 years. I feel like John the Baptist right now. I really do. I'm not kidding. In the body of Christ. I'm not Mr. Holy. I'm not Mr. God it right. I know God, and I won't compromise my relationship with God for anybody. Not for fame, not for money, not for anything. This can't be bought. It can't be bought. I won't ever, because I'm not looking to get a platform so that I can impress people. I want to preach the original gospel. I believe that God wants to do a huge cleansing. If Jesus came back right now, he wouldn't cleanse the world. He cleansed the pulpit. I'm not kidding. He cleansed the pulpit. Why? 
because he wants clean. He wants us to be clean. He wants to, us to live pure. He wants us to live clean. He wants us to raise up a people with holy hearts and clean hands. Who can ascend this holy hill? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He wants us to be a people that aren't just pure in our talk when people are around, but we're pure the whole way through. When's the last time you went to the store and bought a water that said 99% pure? If a water said 99% pure, would you choose that or choose the other one? No, I'm going with smart water because that's a lot smarter than that. But we wouldn't drink water that was impure. What makes us think we can live that way? This is real. This is real. I believe 100% that God wants to freshly touch us tonight. I believe that he wants us to do like a fire tunnel. I believe that. I believe it. I believe that the anointing of what I see and what I believe, I believe that God wants to burn that trash out of you. I believe it. And if you'd be willing to come through here and to get prayer, and if you would genuinely lift up your heart in a place of repentance, God will clean you and completely overwhelm you again with the anointing. He will touch you and completely transform you. He will put that place of fresh love in your heart to where you are gonna burn and go after God with everything in you. So I just got like, I don't know how to do this because this is amazing. We could have an altar call and I know where conviction's at in the room. I know it because we got stuff that we need to get free from. But I don't know how to do this. So, so pastor's scrambling right now to figure out how to do this. Because I know we're ready. But I've got like, this is no joke. God wants to anoint you with power. He wants to anoint you tonight. He wants to anoint you with power. But he wants to make sure that your temple's clean. He wants to make sure that you're clean. He wants to make sure your heart's clean. He wants to make sure that you're free of all that debris because God wants to anoint this house with something seriously special. I'm not kidding. Like he wants to anoint there, but he doesn't just want street evangelists to be in. He wants everybody that's in here to be an amazing witness that burns with holy fire. He wants it. And I want them to play that song like continuously, like tonight. Because I believe that God wants to do something exponential. I believe he wants to touch you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to believe God that's going to touch you. I believe in impartation. I'm 100% an impartation man. I believe that there's the impartation of gifts. I believe that God is going to baptize people afresh in the Holy Ghost. I believe it. I, I traveled with Reinhardt. For those of you that don't know, I got to travel with him for about seven and a half years. You know who Reinhardt Bunky is? I got, to, I got to be with him and Daniel. I went to every fire conference. I got to go to all these schools of evangelism. I would spend an hour with Reinhardt. And like he would pour into me. He was like a father to me. Like, and when Reinhardt went, like when Reinhardt passed away, he would spend exponential time with me. He would give me that time. He was like a father to me. And he would go and spend time, just an hour, an hour and a half, just pouring into me, sharing his heart. And my heart has always been for America. I mean, I love other countries, but I want to see America come to God. I want to see America <laughs> repent. I want to see the fire of heaven hit America. I want to see America come to Jesus. I want to see our schools come to Jesus. I want to see our government come to Jesus. I want to see all the junk that we've allowed in this country to be completely cleansed. That's not the people. That's just the junk. I'm talking not kicking people out of the country. I'm talking about kicking hell out of people. Are you with me? Do you understand? Like, this is a big deal. Reinhardt prayed for me on the last, the last fire conference that he, that he had, he had in Germany. And I think I shared this before, but I'm going to go over it again because it's surging within me and it's really upon my life. And I am feeling this thing in such a heavy way. And I believe it has something to do with your house. So Reinhardt would pray for me constantly. But Reinhardt was about to go be with the Lord. He was at the end. He was run his race and, and he was ready to go. And it was the last fire conference that Reinhardt did. And he brought me up right after he preached because I was getting ready to go down to the city to preach. In the city, Jake Hamilton was going to do worship and I was going to go preach the gospel down in a city with all these bars and stuff. A great place for the gospel, right? So Reinhardt brought me up and he said, and he brought me close and he put his head against my head and he said, Lord... I ask for the mantle that's upon me for Africa to be upon Todd White for America, that America shall be saved. America shall be saved. And it hit me 
with an electric, an electric sensation that I rarely have felt, but it was real and I felt it rip through my being. And the Holy Spirit wants to see America saved. He wants this country saved. But He needs clean hearts and pure hands. People that have a right spirit renewed inside of them. They don't have any junk in their, con in their conscience and in their life. And what God wants to do is tonight, He wants to re-sanitize your conscience. I'm talking about making things brighter. I'm talking about making sin leave. I'm talking about the anointing of God inside of you to where you won't tolerate that stuff anymore, where He'll mark you with His holiness, where the Holy Spirit will touch you in such a way that that junk won't have a voice in your life anymore. That's what He wants to do, and He wants to do it now. And if you guys are in, I want to pray and lay hands on people. I want to believe God that He's going to mark you and change you. That He'll restore that lamp of your first love. He will bring first love back to you. You will be absolutely in love with God again. Like you were when you first got saved. We'll take all that junk. Because repentance says that God takes that stuff, removes it as far as the east is from the west. That's what the gospel says. When you genuinely repent, the Holy Spirit takes your sin away. Your sins and your lawless deeds, God will remember no more. So tonight, He wants to remove that junk so that you can burn with holy fire again, that you can burn with the fear of the Lord, that you can be baptized afresh in the Holy Ghost and fire, that that junk isn't going to whisper your name no more. That's what He's going to do. Are you guys ready? Do you want this? I'm so serious. So I'm going to let whoever's going to lead this and get this thing together. Thanks for watching this sermon. Don't forget to follow us at New Life Corpus. And we would love to see you next Sunday at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., or our 1 p.m. services. God bless.